Welcome to Profession Session with Brody Vincent. I've got my guest, Devin Roberts, here. How you doing? Doing great. How about you? Big great day. to have you. Yeah, yeah. Glad to be here. Up in Jacksonville doing it at the studio this time. It's much, much nicer here than um, at my house in the back room. I definitely like it better. Here. Much better production quality. Much better quality. Listen to my voice. Sounds so much better now. Love oh, it. yeah. The headphones are a game changer. No, for sure. So, Devin, I wanted to have you here to talk a little bit about sales, actually. Fantastic. I'm so excited. I love sales. You happen to be in a field that is entirely sales dependent, and you've been doing very well over the last, what, year and a half or so now? Yeah, yeah roughly. Just just in between. I'm about a year and four months into the um, in-home sales. We do I do specifically solar sales. Um, yeah, I, I'm loving it. Been a great career in the time that I've had. It was in a lot of marketing stuff before this, which was really, really similar, just less face-to-face. Learned a lot of what makes people buy things and the psychology behind it. I was always kind of a talker. That's what makes me good to come on a podcast like this. And I think that really transitioned into moving to people's homes, talking to them about sales and why something is valuable to them and what makes it valuable to them. I, I really do enjoy it. If you had to boil it down to a few different topic points, you mentioned the psychology of what makes someone buy. What are maybe some some big points on that psychology of what makes someone buy that you could hit on? Uh, I think with pretty much anything that you sell, there's I, I, we use it in our company. We call it the four building blocks, essentially. There's four things, in, no matter what industry you're in, that people are looking at to determine whether they are going to buy something. And the first one, I'll go over the four really, really quick. Um, it'll just take me a moment so we can discuss them individually after that. The first one is you as a person. Of course, they care about you. You have to be likable. If you're boring or unlikable or quiet or just not the type of person that that person is, does well with, you're going to have a very hard time selling them on anything that's a high dollar product. Second one is obviously the company that you're backing, whether that's you or whether that's something you're working for. It's your accolades, your history, how long you've been around, what you can actually do. Um, that one's a little less, that's out of most people's control, but it's definitely something that people consider and you have to be able to affirm in their minds. Third one is whatever the value of whatever you're selling, I think would be at your, you know, how much it's worth, how much it's going to save them, obviously. And then the actual product itself. So I'd say it would be, you know, you, the company, the product and the value. So those four things are really what makes up whether someone's going to buy something, what matters to them and whether they actually pick it up as an item. I like it. So, I mean, boiling it down to four distinct pieces, I think kind of simplifies it in your mind and allows you to really have a good grasp on the whole picture. So if you could, let's get a little bit deeper, maybe double click on the first one and start there. Uh, first one I think is the immutable. It's the you. I think if I had, if I have one that's the strongest for me in a house, it's the you factor. I think you have to go in and you have to be entertaining, you have to be exciting, you have to be, um, energetic you to be someone who can assure people they're making the right decision there no matter whether a product is good or bad for you whether you're with a good company or a bad company there's a certain type of person you want to buy from and there's a certain type of person you don't and it doesn't cross over industries you know the the genius engineers that do great in the engineering field can't sell anything because they're quieter more more thoughtful type people people like me who talk off the cuff and say the first thing that comes to their mind, they do much better. We come across maybe a little more genuine on a first meeting. And I think that makes a big difference. And that's, that's a personality thing. So I find a lot of people who are maybe incredible employees, incredible um, workers, intelligent people who just have that one part and it's just not who they are. And they miss that. I think that's the, the part of the you that people are looking for is that it factor, the X factor. So there's a little bit of that to me and yeah, by experience with sales is a lot more limited than yours. But to me, I would say there's a part of it that you kind of just, if you are interested in it, you've got to get in and try it a little bit to see whether it really does mesh well with your personality and whether that does transfer well. Yeah. It's a very t high turnover industry, no matter what you're selling. And the big reason for that is because most companies have become very good at identifying what personalities work for their product and what co personalities don't. So they'll give you a few weeks to work out the kinks, but most of the time you're within a month or two, you're going to know whether you're the type of person who can be bought from or not, who can give that assurance to someone else. And that, that skill is learnable in a way, 
but you do have to be a certain type of person. If you're if you're shy in public speaking, if you would be nervous to get on a podcast like this, I promise trying to sell someone something in their home, trying to sell a business something in a B2B sale, none of that's going to come across well. Bit of a threshold that you need to have now. Right, exactly. Just a just a just a um uh, speaking threshold almost. A speaking class would be what you would take to help that. I, I even when I'm in um, at work, I talk about my podcast history. The little bit that I do have is a big part of what gave me an edge when I came in. Is because I already knew how to turn on the voice. I knew how to make sure I sound at least somewhat smooth, somewhat decent when I'm talking. Not everyone has that. Go record yourself on a podcast and compare it to how I sound right now. Tell me you'll you find sound. out. Yeah, you'll find out real quick. You don't sound as good as you thought, and I think that's a big part of it. Well, cool. And then the second part of that you said was the company that you work for, whether that be your own company, what you're doing, or another company that you're working for. Yeah, I think this one is a lot the, and two of these kind of have that, it's the legitimacy. So I don't want to, because I know a lot of people that are going to be listening to this are going to be people with startups and things of that nature. Most of my sales have been with very large um companies that have scaled to a degree that the company's a lot easier for me than it would be maybe a startup. They're a little more established. Right, exactly. A lot of times you're not going to be as, it's not going to be as easy to sell your company if you've only been doing things for the last year and a half, two years. But that depends on your industry as well. If you're in the NFT business, you only have a year to be able to talk on it. So it just depends. But it's not only that. I don't think it's necessarily your company as much as it is your belief in your company or their belief in your company. So you explain your ability you, to relay that, right? It might not be your history. It might be your team. It might be, we have the five best guys for this project. These guys have had the history. They've had the training. These five minds together are going to do something incredible. There's not a question about that anymore. It's just a matter of who's going to get a piece of the pie. And that might be how you explain it versus my company's been around for so many years, done so many things. Sure. Um, so it's just about knowing that and believing it yourself. Like if you don't believe it, you will not be able to make someone else believe it. People are like, people's bullshit meters are way, way higher than you think they are. And when you're coming to talk to someone about anything that they might be buying there, it's on, it's on 10. The gauge is on 10. They're looking for it. They're looking for the lie. You're, you're a salesman. Like they have those job. walls up immediately. Yeah. And you got to know that. And there can't be any aversion to that. That is their job. They're supposed to put the walls up. Assuming you have a good legitimate product, you really shouldn't hit any friction. Like there shouldn't <laughs> be issues. Um, they're going to ask their questions and you should have legitimate answers for them. And it should be pretty much that simple. That's having confidence in the company. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's really essential that no matter what you're selling, no matter who you're working for, you do have confidence in the company. Exactly. And what was that third point? And that's next one I would say would be product. Product. Let's, let's say product would be what's third, which is just actually what you're selling. So it just depends. You know, I've, I've had a couple startups in my day where I think the product was the issue with a lot of what I was doing. It's just something that's not viable. It's not, there's not enough people that are willing to buy it. You're not pitching to the right market. Your product isn't the best in the industry or um, innovating in any way. You have to take a hard look at your product. And if you're, if you're a salesman for a company, that's not always your job. But if you're a founder, CEO, an innovator in any way, shape or form, you have to look at your product before anything else and say, hey, do people want this? You, I mean, ask your fr uh, friends and family, but like post about it and put it out on social a little bit too. People want your product, you'll, you'll hear it about it if they don't it'll be really silent really quickly like the internet is harsh and unforgiving put your stuff out there if you're not getting any responses on it it might be something in the way you're pitching your product or the way you're putting it out there maybe not the product itself but you better know how to make that product look like the like the mcdonald's burger in the mcdonald's commercial it better Absolutely. look 10 times better than it actually is just for the speech because you have to be that confident just to get through the 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 buyer's bullshit meter just to get it back even you know they're exactly. already they're already taking everything you say and dividing it by 10 so you better be extremely confident so that you at least get somewhere close to what's actually true exactly and i would say you know even thinking after that a lot of sales is going back to the the recognition of the company the product has to actually be valuable and work well and do what you said it's going to do and follow through on that as well because if not Word's going to get around quick and it's going to be bad for business. Right, exactly. And that's You don't want to be the best bicycle salesman in the world selling yeah. a bike that doesn't have wheels. Exactly, exactly. That's a big... That's, I guess it depends. If you're starting a company, then that's a lot of something that you have to consider. If you're a salesman, to be honest, like I've sold products that I know are the absolute best in the business, then people will look at you flat as you believe it and tell you your product sucks and they have absolutely no idea. So sometimes you can have the best product ever 
And if your salesman just doesn't have the conviction that it's the best product ever, maybe the engineer knows it's the best product ever, or the CEO knows it's the best product ever because they spend the time on it. But if those 10 salesmen, they're actually you know, going out making the sale, don't believe it in their souls, then even if it is the best product ever, that's never going to transfer to the other person. So that person's internal belief in the company and the product, himself, the company, and the product, and then transferring it to the other homeowner. And last one's the value, and that's the actual easy one. As far as sales goes, if you have a um, price point, you have a margin that you have to make, and you have any leeway whatsoever, the goal is to get the other person down to where it's all about value. I love the company. I love your product. I like you. I'd love to buy from you. I just got to make sure it's the right price. Exactly. And at that point, it's just, a, it's just a conversation. It's like, hey, what's the right price? And then you figure it out. If you can do it, you can do it. If you can't, you can't. It depends if it makes you money. And you can depart friends if it doesn't work out. And you can sign the deal if it does. And both people wind up happy. But you, if you have to instill those three aspects of a sale, those three confidences in someone before you can ever get in and talk about price. Here's my product. Here am I. Here's what I do and what our company does. Here's my product and why it's the best. Here's why it's going to be a massive value for you and either save you money, make you money, do this awesome thing for you, whatever it is. You hit on something interesting there that I actually didn't catch when you first brought up the four pieces, which is that the order of those four is very essential as well. It's also very essential. You introduce the four things in tandem and kind of keep them all wrapped together, but also, you know, you, the company, the product, the value in that order is kind of that that strategy that's going to work well and tie it all together. I think you're building all of them the whole time, but you have the chance to lose them in that order. So for example, when you hit the door, if your breath smells terrible or you didn't wear a mask and they wanted a mask or everyone in the meeting is in a suit and you're in a t-shirt, you may have lost the you aspect before you ever get a chance to say a word. It's the first but, impression. Right. And not only that, but then it could be, you know, a million different things after your first impression. There's just always a chance to lose that. It could be how you park. It could be a million different things. Think you could wear a, a certain college shirt and the other person, you know, went to the opposing college. It really could be anything. Um, and then the next thing is the company. It's how legitimate you sound in the house if you don't understand your company. You know, I've gone in with subcontracting salesmen that don't really work for the company they're trying to sell. They're just an independent salesman who sells, you know, buys leads and sells and subcontracts out to a different company. They don't know their company. They don't know their product. They don't know their sales process well enough. They're not built into their company. So it doesn't feel legitimate to the homeowner. They're kind of like, what, what is it that y'all really do over there? You get that energy from them. So I think it's a lot about building that. You can lose that very, very quickly if you don't have any accolades. If you don't either go, hey, I'm brand new and it's about my team or my energy or my idea, or you don't go, we've been around forever and it's about our accolades, our history, our leadership. It's kind of got to be one of those two things. And then you have the product, which is just, it's when you show it to them, when you explain the technology, when you explain the design, whatever it is. It's the art of the NFT. It's the design of the solar panel. It's the marketing program and, that you're putting out. It's the workout that you're selling. It's whatever it is. If that sucks, then you suck, kind of, in a way. Like, that's if you if you, you shouldn't have started selling before you made sure that was good. And I think that's one of the biggest points ever. But that's almost not a sales point. That's a CEO starting a company. Right. And then it's the price. The price can always be debated to the very last second. You have yeah. lost the, and that's the biggest problem with salespeople is they're like, oh, my product's too expensive. If they say no, it's just too expensive. You can change the price. Most of the time, if you're a CEO or you're a salesman, you almost always got um, wiggle room. If not, start higher and work with wiggle room. The price can always be discussed till the very last second. Everyone has an issue with the price. I've had an issue with the price of every single thing I've bought in the last 10 years. So... If you, if you don't, you got to expect that. You have to be prepared for it at the end. Make sure the other three are covered. Go to the price. Have the conversation. There's nothing really left for them to say. Exactly. Well, working back from that, I want to kind of touch on something else. So you obviously, and I know this just from talking to you about what you do a lot, but you have been very successful in what you're doing right now. And you have found a position for yourself where you have a very reasonable price with a great value that you're offering you know, kind of working backwards with a product that is really great that you believe in. Absolutely. You're working for a fantastic company. Best in business. What are kind of working all the way back to the first thing? What are some of the things that you have done to improve your sales skills as you've gone through this year and four months that have really made the difference for you? Maybe some of the turning points for you. Uh, 
I've had some very, 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 very honest managers who have walked me through a lot of what it takes to turn, you know, uh, someone who's maybe new into business or new into sales into a true professional. Um, I, I know I'm on video right now and I'm wearing a fancy suit, but it's Tai Tuesdays. I don't always dress this nice. It's really more about my routine throughout the day and what I'm doing. It's about getting up early, early in the morning, starting my day way before the sale, not being tired, eating food in the morning, working out if I have the ability, making sure I'm on top of everything, not being late to any single appointment ever, just every single little step. Everyone says, yeah, 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 I know that stuff. But the trick is like cutting two corners does a lot more damage than you realize. If you do everything right, if you don't cut any corners, you just get up, you go and you do it the same way, the right way, every single day, then all of a sudden things start like three and four and five Xing. All of a sudden it's like the two cents more effort, the 2% more effort, five Xs your earnings or what um, you wind up being able to accomplish. And I think that's what I've seen more than anything is the little things Every salesman does about the same amount of good, spends about the exact same amount of time in front of the homeowner or the buyer, spends the amount of same time in the conference room or the house. But the little things that they do different. The little intangibles that would seem almost unrelated, but do end up tying back into it. Yes, exactly. Following up with your homeowner after the fact. They, I take a photo with my with my customers after we finish a deal just to say, you know, profile picture of the deal on my, on my folder. I send it to them two weeks later. Follow up, make sure they don't have any questions. You know, just little things like that. Showing up on, you know, the day that you're finally closing or the day um, that they're having, you know, the, the second message man out, you know, because sometimes you're not the only closer and just saying hi, making sure they have no issues, placing an extra call. It's just the people that really, really focus on it. So I found that I slip in numbers when I focus on other things. So what my skill has become, and so it became a catch between too. How am I supposed to do my, my primary sales job, which is solar, while also being able to grow side hustles and other things of that nature, if when I focus on the side hustles, it pulls away from this. And I think the trick is learning that you have to take value in every second, waking up early, valuing every second, and then being 100% focused on what you're doing while you're doing it. If I'm doing solar, if I'm with a homeowner, if I'm with a customer, I am 100% focused on that. My other stuff has been put away for hours. I've been studying or thinking about it or getting ready for a period of time before I ever am front face with somebody. Or if I'm doing my stuff, then I'm I've put my iPad and my phone away. I've set some space on my desk. I've got my headphones. I'm away from the family. I'm away from food. That's all done. And I sit two hours and I do it because the five minutes here and there doesn't really work long term. You just set and carve time. Do you have devices that are a device or devices, plural, that are specifically dedicated to the solar sales job? No, but I need one. Yeah, I was going to say that I feel like that would help even more because I know of some cases where people have kind of really gone out of their way to set up something like that, where it makes that distinction, you know, even easier. Right. No, I definitely, definitely agree that it would make a massive difference if I was able to separate in that way. But I'm constantly checking emails, phone calls, anything else. Sometimes missing something for 20 minutes can make a massive difference in the way my day goes, how tired I am, if I'm late seeing somebody. Due to that, I've made a point of keeping everything on one device, everything as close as I possibly can. Just about staying on top of it. If I don't let myself get behind in emails, I don't let myself get behind in calls. I push as many people, you know, if you're a if you're someone I need to talk to on the phone because you don't really text, that's absolutely fine. But if there's an option, please text me. Like I don't want another second on the phone that I have to be. Everyone I'm the same I'm, way. Everyone my car rides, I feel like it's like, okay, awesome. Two hour car ride. That's five phone calls I can take care yep. of, checking them off the list. And if you're not using your time like that, like there's going to be people listening here that are like in college or like reasonably young or newer into this, even people that we might know where it's just like you probably I would bet not even within our circles, our peers, people younger than us, especially don't understand that once you like scale into that, how much time it takes up. Like I used to think like 40 hours a week of work was a lot. And that's so scary now because I'm probably double. And it's like, that's standard. Like if you're not at, if you're not working 60 to 80 hours a week, and that means like on all your stuff. Everything all together. Right. If you're not at 80 hours a week, like you're not really there yet. Like you're probably putting what, 40 to 50 in for the solar alone. Oh, I'm at least. Maybe 60. Yeah, 50 in minute. Yeah. Yeah, 50 every week. Um, for sure. Sometimes I'll sit down like, like on Friday, I was in Gainesville from 8am to 7pm. So it was like a 12 hour day in Gainesville hour 
hour and a half drive down, hour and a half drive back, three and a half appointments. I say a half because one didn't show up. Um, but yeah, so that's the idea is you'll, you'll have days like that, but then I'll have days like today where I had this three hour block in the middle and I could stop by here and get this done, but this is still three hours. I'm still talking about my sales, talking about my job. Y'all are going to call me and get solar appointments. Um, it's going to be great. <laughs> um, so you have to realize that it all counts. It all takes energy. Um, but you have to fill your time completely. What happens is people go, oh, my job is so tiring. I just go in the arrest when I come home. Let me leave that time empty. But what happens is you wind up just losing it to fucking phone and video games yeah. and nothing else. You have to set aside a block and say, hey, I'm going to do this at this time. Sit on the couch and work on my computer, respond to my emails. It's the same thing. It's the same amount of energy, Byron. It's just you're actually focusing on something that moves you forward. I think it's about allotting your time like that. I love it. Um, one other thing I wanted to ask. So what was maybe like a light bulb moment for you when you were getting into sales that told you, okay, this is for me because I think there's a lot of people that do try to get into sales. And we talked about this a little bit earlier, but that could be a very subjective, difficult area to really figure out for yourself individually. So I think it'd be helpful to say, okay, what were maybe one or two really light bulb moments for you that said, oh, this is for me? Uh, I think it depends on your goals. So it's the trade, right? Is is I decided I wanted to be in sales because I knew there were two or three aspects that you had to have, like the personality. I knew I could talk. I knew I had that aspect. So before anything, you just have to have like the gift of the gab a little bit. If you're uncomfortable talking, you should call it there. Um, you got to like making a lot of money. That's the second one. So it's, it's about money. It's, it's about you making sales. You profit for companies. So that's the metrics they're focused on. Making a lot of money. Who wants that? Well, right. But like some people want to focus on work-life balance. Yeah. Like you want, you have work-life balance, but that's not what the company is focused on. You're a salesman. Your, yeah. your goals, your job, your skill, your value is based on how much money you can make for them and for therefore for yourself. Exactly. So a lot of people find that difficult. I like um, goal-oriented jobs in that way. So it worked better for me than others. But then I think the other aspect of it is you have to decide what the trade was. I just realized it was like, I'm going to, if I wanted to start my own company, if I want to do my own thing, what I'm really doing it for is to scale to making a certain amount of money a year and then launching another company. So I realized that through sales with about a quarter of the work and absolutely zero overhead or risk, I could get to that same level of income and then launch off of that with much, much, much less volatility and risk. So for me, it was a long-term plan. The actual summer that I got my initial job or like the, the spring that I got it, I told myself that that summer, I was, it was beach summer. I wasn't going to do anything. I was going to like just focus on my stuff, avoid jobs, make enough money to get my thing started and work it up from there because it's always a slow start when you're starting a new company. Um, and um, when I got the sales thing, I instead I decided I moved into doing that, training for that, getting everything done. And I just realized I was like, wow, everything that I was going to be able to accomplish by doing my own thing, I can do through here master skills that will actually inevitably when I launch my own company, do my final project more viable. And through doing that, I've honestly been able to do more, launch more projects, invest in more things than I ever would have been, not even close before. Like I wasn't even playing with, you know, a fourth or a fifth of the money. It's just a whole different game once you're actually at that point. I love it. Anything you would say to that person that is just starting out with their sales job, kind of last thoughts that you would give them to make sure that they're getting right off on the right foot? Uh, yeah, really thick skin. That's the trick to this job more than anything is energy and attitude. It's like I said, the way you're going into a house, the way you're going in front of a client, the way you're entertaining people is what makes you a valuable salesman. And someone giving you a hard question, giving you a dirty look, distrusting you for a minute, that puts your energy off. Or even saying no. Or saying no. I mean, people are so scared of the no. Embrace the no. Embrace the no. Every buyer ever says no. Every single one of them. If they don't say no, then there's something wrong. That's kind of weird. So embrace that. Embrace the negativity that's going to come from them. They're going to air it at you, and then you're going to handle it. That's your whole job. So you can't let other people get you negative and get your emotions worked up. That's the most important aspect of sales, keeping yourself centered so you can make them feel the same way. I love it. Well, thank you for coming on. This has been Profession Session with Devin Roberts. Absolutely. Appreciate having you. 